Welcome to today's webinar. Today we'll be discussing understanding educational trauma and how to create programming to support American Indian and Alaska Native youth. My name is B.C. Echohawk, and I'm a member of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. On behalf of the Native Connections team and contracting officer representatives Maureen Madison and Jan Dunbar-Cooper, thank you all for joining us. Today we'll discuss what educational trauma is, how it affects our Native youth education, and how they can be supported by their communities in a culturally relevant way. You're welcome to share your thoughts and comments at any time. Use the raise hand function and we'll call on you for comments. Also feel free to enter questions or comments in the chat box any time during the session. Right now I'm gonna turn it over to our colleague, Elwood Pipestem Ott, who will open us up in a good way. Elwood? Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. I know it's the bid day, so I'm going to open it up with something that I like to do. Um, before I start my day, the midday, and towards the end of the day, and that is five deep breaths. And you don't have to hold it as long. Just hold it as long as you want. Let it out. Push all that air out of there. Take five of them. It's refreshing for us. The midday, sometimes we need that little refreshing reminder. Sometimes we need that breath of fresh, fresh air. And this time of the year is, is a busy time for a lot of people. We have the state track meets. We have the end of the school years. We have the excitement going on for summer break for a lot of the youth and educators. Uh, but that breath of air helps us recharge. And it helps us let go of some of the the negative things that we've encountered throughout the day, throughout the moments. Um, but I encourage you all to make time for yourself to take those deep breaths and let go. Help recharge yourself and keep moving forward. And at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to you, BC. A uh who? Thank you, Elwood. I I believe uh, Sharon or Elma will get us started here. Yes. Welcome, everyone. Dos inawanese na asahena hinana ena na 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 ta na bita na de una ni bita My name is Alma Brown. I'm with Native Connections. I'm a grantee technical assistant. And unfortunately, Miss Idella King will not be with us today, but she's put together a great webinar and presentation. I am excited for you all to. Um, learn with us and be with us today. I'm going to turn it over to our presenter, Miss Juliana Eagle Bear, and she will give you the introduction. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Juliana Eagle Bear, but I usually go by Anna. Most people know me by Anna. Um, I hail from Spokane, Washington. I'm from the Diné Nation. Yat eh. Um, my clans are um, Sanjikine, Tabal, Bashishchin, for you Navajos that are out there in our audience. Um, I work for student services under Spokane Public Schools here in Spokane and um, kind of navigate between departments. So I'm also sort of an unofficial support person for our Native Education Department here as well, even though I'm officially under student services. Um, there's just not very many of us natives here in Spokane Public Schools, so we just kind of interchange quite a bit in some of the things that we do here. Um, and thank you for having me. And I'd like to introduce um, Sharon. She has agreed to join us on short notice, and so we are grateful for her mm. expertise and her um, excitement to be here as well. So Sharon. Oh, uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. Thank you for being with us. My name is Sharon Eagleman. I'm a member of the Fort Peck Assiniboine and Sioux Tribes of Montana, and also the Little Traverse Bay Band of Ottawa Indians from Michigan. And I, as Idella shared, as Alma shared, I'm also a grantee technical assistant, and I'm 
like she said, I am helping out this afternoon and um, I'm just excited for this presentation. Next slide. Thank you. So here we have our Native Connections approach graphic. And we've talked about, you know, throughout this year, we've discussed in various uh, webinars and um, different uh, learning opportunities, how uh, these different parts and pieces fit together, you know, starting with the community systems analysis, the community readiness model, the SAP and then implementation of, of your strategic action plan. So with the community readiness model, after we've completed this step and determined our community's readiness for change, this, this webinar that we're, we're, we're providing today is centers in this area. This is where um, we start our programming for our youth. And we take into account different things like historical trauma, but we also discuss our historical strengths. And um, so when we talk about our youth and their educational journey and some of the interventions and activities and programs and supports that we provide, that would fall under this graphic. So I'll go ahead and turn this over to Alma for the next slide. Thank you, Sharon. Um, as Sharon has mentioned, you know, we've really kind of delved into Native Connections in the four parts that the graphic shows in this Educational Historical Trauma um, webinar today falls right under the community readiness. You know, how it can be culturally appropriate for the activities and the intervention strategies that your communities can provide um, also falls into GONA under Mastery um, the historical trauma and resilience and how that fits into GONA as well. And so we really encourage um, your communities to utilize your SPIF and to also utilize evidence-based practices and programming within your, within Native Connections and within your grant. Um, and this is just one way how you can start utilizing Native Connections on a broader approach and not necessarily within the four part series, but how other community activities that you do um, can tie into that as well. And so this is what, so that we'd really like to, we really would like to start encouraging you to utilize that more within your own programs. Mm -hmm. Hey, Elma, can I say one more thing about Absolutely. the community? Um, you know, one of the things about, um, historical trauma is this impacts every single youth within Native Connections somehow, some way, with, because a lot of our youth are in public schools or boarding schools. And our history, you know, we have such a historical trauma to, you know, the educational system that when we come across um, people like Anna, which you're going to hear from in a few minutes, when you really start looking at the resilience part of this and it really can show you, you know, how how far we've moved away from those. We're moving away from those trauma responses. But I've been really excited about this webinar today because, you know, we we really do talk a lot about the community readiness. What is your community ready to do? And I think as you're going to hear from Anna today, you're really going to start maybe um, hearing some new terms, new approaches, you know. But what she brings with for you today, just remember, you know, we have the SPIF there. We want you to take this information, move it into your community. And if it's appropriate for you, use it, you know, um, adjust it, make it work for you. But this is such an important topic because, again, every every youth that we have in our Native Connections program, all of our programs right from cohort one have all been impacted somehow by <clears throat> um, trauma and really resilience in the in trauma in the educational field. So I just wanted to add that really quick. So thank you, Anna. Thank you, Oma. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And so we will go on to the next slide and Sharon will go over our objectives. Okay. So some of the areas that we are going to cover today include how to determine aspects of the educational trauma and how that is how that shows up in our school systems and examining current data trends and their relation to educational trauma. And then we'll also look at how to apply 
educational terms and how they relate to the school system structure. And we'll also discuss how to partner and different ways to create ideas of how to support our youth in a culturally relevant way within our communities and in our school systems. And then I shall turn this over to Anna. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so um, we'll just dive right in. Um, so let me, just to give you a little bit of background before we begin, um, a little bit of my background. Uh, I've been in education for a number of years. I have taught in public schools on reservations, on the Navajo Reservation and Colville Reservation and the Spokane Reservation here in Washington. Um, different types of schools. One was a culturally run boarding school and two of them were public schools on the reservation reservation location. And currently, I have been a number of years in the urban setting here in Spokane, the city of Spokane. Um, so I feel um, I'm hoping that with this presentation, I can hit the various backgrounds of maybe where our viewers uh, sit in terms of uh, learning and gaining from this presentation and hopefully I can glean a little bit of what I've learned from coming from Indian education from those various backgrounds, because they are definitely a lot of variances, a lot of different perspectives, even down to um, tribal influence in terms of where your location is. Uh, and it's been my experience, some tribal influences are stronger than in other places. So, I mean, it, there's just no one fit all uh, scenario. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat or, you know, however they presented it. Cause I think uh, for the most, for the most important part, as far as where I'm coming from is to um, teach and learn. This is what this presentation is about. So uh, with that, we'll dive right in. So what is historical trauma? So we have a fact sheet loaded up and I think uh, there's a little, uh, what do you call those, Q code there that you can use your um, cell phone to locate. And it's actually a fact sheet. It's pretty, I think it's a pretty straightforward, short clip. It's a real easy read. And it kind of goes into the straightforward definition of what historical trauma is. Um, and historical trauma, as we know it, as it's defined in this sheet and among many other organizations, is that it is a trauma that is cumulative and collective. So uh, pertaining to, for example, Native Americans, we have a lot of historical trauma, as Deborah has mentioned. Um, and what we know about that is that even if the trauma is not experienced um, uh, first person that if a grandmother had experienced trauma, that trauma can actually go through the generation and there still will be residual uh, behaviors and reactions from the grandchild. So um, that being said, for example, a student in school may come to school and you know, display attitudes and perspectives towards education that stem from maybe grandma and her views and perspectives from her trauma experience and maybe boarding school experience that she, you know, expressed with her children and her grandchildren and that kind of residually carries over. So that tends to happen quite a bit. Um, and even in the urban setting, I see a lot of that. Uh, we have families that relocate from uh, reservation areas into the city. Um, and some of the families are even educated, but we still see residuals of some of that trauma uh, in the school system with our students. So we're gonna go, um, there's more definition, as you can see from the, the handout about historical unresolved grief, disenfranchised grief, and internalized oppression. And we're going to go a little bit more into what those are a few slides down um, when we get to it. But right now, um, you could go to the next slide. So 
here is the slide of what I just um, went over, that uh, it is cumulative and it is collective. OK. And what happens then is that the manifestation of some of this trauma um, that you might see in what I have seen, for example, uh, with students. From the reservation, what I see quite a bit is still there is a stronger presence of some of the trauma that happens within the communities um, in comparison to those families that I've witnessed and seen in the city. So um, on the reservation, you still have um, a high number of substance abuse, of a lot of family disenfranchisement. Um, and there are families that have worked and done the work and are coming back to try to heal the community as well. So there's really a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The a really um, a contrast between the two. And so that's more uh, present and evident on schools that I've been in on the reservation. Whereas in the urban setting, I think uh, because a lot of families, um, some have had generations in the city, so they have become a little more uh, adaptive to some of the systems that uh, they're required to adapt to, uh, school systems, government systems, and so forth, the jobs, and all these things you have to pay. If they own a house, they have to learn how to pay, you know, city tax, property taxes, and all those kinds of things. And those are like city things, maybe a, a colonialized process that um, that has to be learned in order to, you know, sustain themselves in the city. And so they move away from some of that attachment they have to tribal lands, um, inherited lands. Um, they might have be a landowner but still live in the city and they just monitor their property on the reservation if they've got um, allotment land or so forth. And so there's definitely a unique, um, a unique um, formula in terms of how they have to coordinate those two worlds. And so because of the nature and the history of how they're, some of the families are able to do that, they're able to adapt a little more and they're more apt to go and seek services if they need it. Um, they begin to learn to navigate the city resources. Uh, most cities in urban settings may have a center or a place where they can go as sort of like a, a central point, like a, a Indian community center, or it might be a, a native clinic or uh, some type of native organization. Usually it's a nonprofit and various cities will have that available. Um, and those are kind of the center points where they may access different types of services depending on what the organization's focus is. Some may be substance abuse, some may be youth outreach, some may be a health clinic, um, or maybe housing, food bank, and so forth. And so um, what happens then in terms of networking within our school system, uh, especially where I'm at in the city, uh, and looking at some of these pieces with historical trauma, um, sometimes resources can be limited uh, because not only do I see some of these uh, things happening within our Indian community, right now in Spokane we have a lot of um, immigrants and refugees coming from the war in the Middle East, a lot of um, Ukraine uh, refugees are coming over and uh, people from the Middle East, um, Iran, Iraq, uh, Palestine and so forth. And we're seeing those kids in the buildings and they are demonstrating a lot of the same behaviors, um, which, you know, of course is understandable. They are, um, their families have recently experienced immense trauma from war and so they become shell-shocked and, and what happens is it really puts a strain on some of the resources we have in the public schools. Um, if you're from a place where you're directly on a reservation and it's uh, not urban like what I'm in um, and your resources may even be more um, 
less expansive and you know it does become a challenge in looking at how can we provide services for kids and families that might have and deal with some of these um, items stemming from historical trauma. Next slide. Um, so this particular painting, and, and I, when Idella and I were, were collaborating, um, this is from a local artist here in Spokane. His name was Rick Gendron. He was one of our beloved friends. Um, and bless his heart, he's, he's no longer with us. But his painting was very um, explicit in terms of the boarding school experience, historical trauma, you know, the cutting off of braids when they were going to enter into the school. It's like a severing of one's identity. And today, uh, in this day and age, and it depends what region of the, of the country you're from, some are supportive in terms of um, maintaining the long hair look. Some are not. Um, we still have a lot in our community, even with kids. They can be cruel to one another, where they tease for a child to, that has maybe has braids or long hair in their male. Um, and so what little that I can do in some of the things that we have offered in the, the, the movements we have in the city is kind of uh, the long hair movement. Uh, we have some posters out there that kind of show, you know, be proud of your braids and those kinds of things. And hopefully that influence can go and educate others that it's having long hair and braids is not a girl thing. It's, you know, a cultural thing. It's a cultural um, expression and it's who we are. Um, it's very valuable to us. Hair is very valuable to us as native people. So we hope to communicate that in the community. Um, doesn't always reach everybody because uh, we do have a lot of school buildings here in Spokane. We have like 38 elementary schools. We have, I believe, seven middle schools and five high schools. So um, the, the amount of native people we have working in our district, I can count on like two hands. So definitely there's a lot of education to be had in our own district, in fact. So if a family is encountering problems that pertain to a cultural nature, it is unfortunately um, not addressed right away. But we'll, we'll keep working at that with education. Go ahead. Next slide. Okay, I guess we are at the first breakout room. So, um, go ahead and go to the next slide. We have um, in our breakout room, um, what we'd like to do uh, is you as participants to discuss stories within your breakout room of experiences that you have heard from family members um, or even maybe your own experiences uh, when you were in school or that you've seen other people, classmates that may have experienced uh, that pertain to some of these things that, um, you know, kind of tie to some of that trauma uh, in, you, you know, educational experience. For example, you may have heard a story about your grandmother um, that she may have told about one of her childhood experiences pertaining to boarding school or an aunt or an uncle or a cousin or, and so forth. And so as you share your experiences, what we're going to do is keep in mind as we go into the following slide following the breakout room is we're going to discuss, you know, the historical unresolved grief, disenfranchised grief and internalized oppression and see if some of those experiences that you had shared or talked about pertain to maybe one of those three. Um, and so we can kind of make that connection in terms of what that actually looks like in application, like what is actually manifesting, and this is coming from you. So we'll go ahead and go out to the breakout room. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Oh, welcome back from your breakout rooms. I hope you guys had some great discussion um, in regards to how um, your experience of what type of experiences um, 
that you were able to discuss. Um, so three common words that I heard within our breakout rooms was how, parent, how parenting can be impacted due to boarding schools, um, the distrust um, of the educational system, whether that is public or um, tribal or boarding schools, and the fear that some elders may have or community, may, community members may have towards school systems. Sharon, would you like to share out from your group? Hi, this is Sally, I think. Am I Sharon? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, three common words uh, that, that we came up was, one was language, second one was perseverance, and mm -hmm. the third one was hair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And let's see, I think the, um, the third breakout room, um, we had a talk, we had um, heard about, you know, trauma and how it affected the individual, you know, people, youth going to school, and then the gr the grief that they carried with them and how that impacted them. They talked, uh, we talked about loss, you know, and what that looks like or what that felt like. But we also talked about resilience from each one of these three words, you know, and how the resilience carried through in our families. Thank you. Turn it back over to you, Juliana. Oh, did we have two more breakout rooms or just the two? We have three total this time. Okay. Okay. Um, and three shared already. I think we had one more. No? Okay. Well, all right. We'll we'll go right into it. So um listening to the three words pertaining to uh, discussions and all the, the, the ones that keep coming up, the themes. Um, the first, go ahead and go to the next slide. Sorry, Mark. Okay. So we have historical unresolved grief. Um, so thinking about the stories that you've heard and that were shared, um, the unresolved grief is something that um, if there's a trauma that had happened that was not adequately expressed or acknowledged or otherwise resolved. So for example, um, the Holocaust could be one. Um, maybe some of the massacres in the United States, our history, uh, the Sand Creek massacre, some of these things, or um, the the battle of little what is that the battle of wounded knee it was not a battle it was a massacre and those types of things that go unacknowledged so some of that residual of of something being mislabeled and was actually a war crime when you take a look at it but is considered oh yeah that was the battle no i don't think it was a battle at all so some of those things are unresolved grief in our history uh even within our tribes um, maybe with our families, um, things that might have happened during the civil rights era, some of the injustices uh, with families um, that had occurred. Uh, MMIW is a classic one in modern day where uh, some of these investigations just don't happen or they're not done adequately. Um, so those can trigger unresolved grief. Um, the next one, disenfranchised grief. Now, this is when a loss cannot be voiced publicly um, or is not openly acknowledged. Uh, a perfect example of that would be Every Child Matters movement when they found um, all the graves in the, in the boarding school areas and up in Canada. And um, I think us in the States, we all know it's similar down here, but no one's talking about it. No one's going to acknowledge it. No, the 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 president's not going to issue an apology anytime soon. I don't think. And so we haven't even gotten to the point um, of where of where we're even acknowledging it. So that's disenfranchised grief. Grief, sorry, disenfranchised grief. And so um, where we know some things have happened, some injustices, some horrible things have happened to uh, our people. Um, our ancestors and what they've endured, but no one has really acknowledged it in terms of 
uh, authority figures, government, or anything of that case. And that can be carried through families. That creates the distrust with systems, with government systems, the whole scenario of um, the uh, let's keep the door shut and the curtains pulled and we're not going to answer the door right away. And I have this story with my own kids where none of them have any of the boarding school experiences or anything that I, my husband, or my parents have had. But um, one day we had this uh, visitor knock on the door and my kids were, we were all in the living room as a family. Well, someone knocked on the door and they scattered like cockroaches. They took off and I'm like, like they were hiding from something. I'm like, what? So, you know, I go and, you know, go in the door and it was just some, someone selling, uh, some kids selling candy bars or something. It's something very non-threatening. And I just dealt with it. And I called them all back in. I said, why did you guys all run? And they're like, I don't know. And they couldn't even connect why they would try to run and hide. And so I'm just like, wow, I wonder you know, some of those behaviors had manifested because as kids, we did that. Um, but we were afraid that, you know, the school was going to come and take us because that's what my mom had said happened to her. So we connected that. Um, but for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how my kids ended up doing that, even if I didn't say or share that story openly with them. They somehow inherently did the same behavior. So I think, you know, as far as we talk about historical trauma and how they manifest, even with all that unspoken um, language, body movement, maybe reactions, somehow they've also have inherited some of those same uh, fears without even intentionally being taught. And that's how it kind of goes and trickles through the, the generations. Now, the third one, internalized oppression. Now, this is one that is very common that I've heard even in our discussion. So internalized oppression is the result of historical trauma where they begin to internalize the views of the oppressor or perpetrator. Now, what happens then is this causes that cycle of self-hate. Um, it manifests ways like, um, let's say you have, you're in an urban setting and you have a group of Indian kids and there's not very many of them, there's just a few, but they end up getting in fights all the time with one another. Well, they don't fight with anyone else, but they will fight with one another. Or they tend to pick on um, that kid who is native, the only other kid, Maybe they're in a different class or whatever. And it's like, why would you target that kid? I mean, you've got, you know, so many other options, especially with the building that I'm in. But they'll target that kid and the only other Indian kid that's in the school. And so that is a manifestation of eternalized oppression when you look at a, a, a form of of thinking about the things, How what's the phrase I, I equate that with? These are the things I hate about myself that I am going to perpetrate against someone else. That is eternalized impression. Um, we also see this in social media where um, sometimes something goes viral, right? Uh, someone does something and then in the country they'll reshare and reshare like the whole, um, I don't know if it's a, uh, the, the recent Gona, I mean, not Gona, the recent uh, Gathering of Nations scandal, I, you know, it just kept popping up on my feed. The the memes and the, the all these things about the the things that are happening and the political views of that powwow and what the um, sponsor said and then the, just the gossip flurries. Well, anyway, um, some of that has to do with internalized impression. It has to do with things that we've been um, oppressed by for so long. And there's a few of us that are beginning to recognize and speak out about it. And then there are those who will sit back and say, no, you know, I'll just deal with that. Um, and so it begins to manifest 
some of those things that we have just been quiet about for so long. Uh, then it causes a conflict between those that aren't ready to deal with that and those that are tired of it. And yeah, I'm going to speak up and say something about it. Then we cause a conflict between the two parties. Um, and we see a lot of that in Indian country, I think in various, various platforms politically, when you think about tribal elections and tribal politics um, in school systems with the kids and their social behaviors. I mean, it, there's just so many platforms that this can apply to. It also applies very much so from what we were talking about in our breakout room is why uh, we have language um, sustainability problems. Why do we have, why do some tribes have problems um, keeping their language alive? It does have to do with boarding school. It does have to do with the messages that boarding school had. What traumas have our ancestors, you know, have to uh, go through um, the belittling, the the shaming of talking your language? Well, they grow up, they come home, they have their own families, and that trauma is still present in um, and what I shared with my own experience, my own mother had um, gone to great effort to keep us from learning the language because she really believed that if we had a native language as our first language, that we would not go to college, we would not have good jobs, and we would not do well in society. And of course, she wants the best for us, but it was her belief that and that's the message that boarding school had taught her. Don't teach your kids the language or they're not going to do well in school. And so, um, and back in those days, that was her best intention, her in her mind, the best way to parent us and, and you know, assure our future was going to be well. Well, we come to present day and a lot of us are wanting to keep language alive. We've learned that actually having more language and dual transibility across our brain is actually better because we have more neurons connectors open what makes us smarter actually if we can uh, navigate between languages constantly it kind of keeps those neurons alive and active um, so that that's what we talked about and so when you think about your experiences you may have um, hopefully connection to at least one of these three and it'll help you understand um, maybe some of the groups you're working with you might see similar things that manifest that may pertain to one of these areas okay next slide how much time do i have 10-ish minutes okay um well because of these factors and i think i just covered this slide go ahead and go to the next one so how does all this impact um, education? And so I selected about four areas that uh, you may see in the school system. Um, attendance, behavior, social emotional effects, and academics. So when we look at traumas that stem from boarding schools, let's look at the first one, attendance. Next slide. So what I've seen um, oftentimes when I'm working with families, when I have families, Native families that um, whose children are not coming to school, um, it, it's from the family having a passive value placed on school attendance. So if the child says, oh, I don't feel like going to school today, the parent may say, oh, okay, yeah, because when I was young, I had to go to school. I was forced to. You know, I went to boarding school. I actually lived at the school, and I had to go to school. I didn't have that choice. But, you know, I'll give you that choice as my child. And so that carries over. The child begins to like, okay, well, school is not, must not that be that important. So, um, yeah, we'll just, we'll just not go to school. And so that passive value gets communicated in that manner. Uh, it tends to anyway. Um, so... The other thing that you'll see quite a bit is a school will get involved with home where school is calling home all the time. They're getting phone calls. They maybe do a home visit once or twice. And I've been the fortunate one to be in that position as well as far as home visits. Sometimes the door will answer. Sometimes it won't. <laughs> 
And so it all it does is it actually um, supports that whole story that I told you beforehand when my kids scattered that, oh, the school is here. Be quiet. Don't answer the door. You know, there's that systematic oppression like, oh, you know, the school entity of school is coming and, you know, we have to be quiet or they'll, I think they'll say they'll take you away. They won't put it in those terms, but somewhere it triggers in their mind that similar trauma that maybe their grandparents talked about or whatever, and that fear is still present. So they won't, they won't deal with it. Um, the other thing that impacts attendance when kids don't come to school is, especially in our district, when we look at Native education, um, some of the extra funding we get for our kids that are documented as Native kids, we get federal fundings for our Native ed. If they don't come to school um, and they don't have a regular attendance log or even shown because if they're not coming to school they're not going to be passing classes right um that it does have immense impacts especially if the kid is in high school and not coming to school then that leads to failing grades and failing grades leads to no graduation or delayed graduation and it affects our graduation numbers um the colonization impact of this of course is that us as a government entity, school, we are mandated by all these things from the state, from the feds. We have rules to follow. We have numbers to meet. We have certain data to uphold. Um, if we have grants, we have to meet that data. And, oh, you haven't reached this percentage. That was our goal is have this percentage number of kids graduate, and we're not there yet or our attendance needs to improve by so much percentage and we didn't meet that yet. And so a lot of um, organizations and even some of you might be in this position where you are um, kind of charged to figure out how are we gonna make that improvement. Oh. Um, go ahead, next slide. So behavior. Behavior is something we see, and I've got about five-ish, ten-ish minutes. Um, so we talk about ACEs, and I don't know if, if many of you have heard ACEs. Maybe all of you have. It's Adverse Childhood Experiences Indicators, and this is actually a measurement tool that um, a lot of mental health places, maybe some uh, behavioral health places um, kind of utilize where it measures a student's uh, score, ACEs score, if you will, uh, to kind of determine the impact of trauma that person has sustained. So a person with a higher ACEs score, of course, might be at higher risk. Um, and this is just a brief little list of what that might be. Um, and so what that means is it's sort of a measure of the higher the score, the chances that that person is going to engage in one of the impacts of trauma on the list to the right uh, is pretty high. Um, and behavior problems are one of that in school systems. Learning problems. Um, kids with high trauma traumatic experiences, they kind of manifest as if they have um, ADHD but really it's actually an issue, uh, an interpersonal issue in terms of a lack of security. And so it revs up their behavior, their anxiety, and that anxiety manifests in so many different ways. Um, it might be the child is weepy. It might be that they're very um, standoffish, or it might be that they're very guarded. And in that case, you know, they're, they're constantly, um, in opposition with other kids in their class. Go ahead, next slide. So social emotional, um, this is uh, an impact that affects their concentration and memory, organizational skills, um, even language abilities. We have kids that are in speech therapy, uh, definitely academic performance. 
Um, you'll see inappropriate behavior in the classroom, whether they can't gauge how to react to something. A lot of times they will overreact um, in terms of, you know, either they'll cry or they'll lash out physically by hitting someone who didn't really, that were teasing them and they were just joking, but, you know, this kid will come out swinging, um, things like that. Uh, they'll have difficulty forming relationships or keeping relationships. Um, there's a lot of hypervigilance. So if something goes on in the room, you know, this kid is really paying attention, especially if it's something that pertains to some type of conflict, even between adults. Um, and they tend to display a lot of oppositional or disruptive behaviors. And that is also kind of in parallel to like things that you'll see with a student who has attention deficit disorders and, and anything like that. Um, this kind of can be in the same ballpark and sometimes it's hard to delineate if you have uh, how you deal with that type of behavior depending on where it stems from really takes a lot of observation a lot of knowledge of family history um, those kinds of things and there's ways that you can use to help uh, deal with some of those behaviors and it's kind of my job here in the district what I do okay slides Next slide. Oh, go back. Academics. All right. So academics definitely um, it impacts graduation rates, grade level readings, grade level math. Uh, child is impulsive, so therefore they tend to be sent out of class quite a bit. Um, what it does is it, it the impulse behavior stems from what we call um, a lack of security. And I don't know if some of you have heard that um, circle of security theory that they have out there. Uh, the guy who created that or actually does a lot of work with that um, institute is actually here in Spokane. So we're kind of blessed to have him come into our buildings and actually train us about circle of security and, and what that is and how that manifests. So. Um, that's kind of a, a cool perk of being here in Spokane in the same place where this institute is. Okay, next slide. So this is something that he talks about. So part of the um, circle of security is when a child has a secure base, um, the child is secure enough to go and explore. They'll go out a little bit. Um, they know they're being watched and they're feeling safe. Um, the child who does not feel secure, they have to reside in a place where they are constantly looking to be protected. They are constantly having to find a touchstone person that they know can protect them. Um, they tend to be highly attached or detached at the same time. So they get very um, weepy if their person they consider their safe patient goes out of their area or is gone, they'll get really scared and they don't know if they're coming or going. And um, oftentimes at that point when they know they don't have their secure place present, they'll then go off and the, they won't acknowledge um, boundaries or barriers or, or, for example, they could just wander off somewhere without even knowing that that's not the place to go. And for example, we have some kindergartners here who uh, will just walk out of their classroom and we had one just go out on the playground like there's just no uh, connection of like, mm, we don't do that. And he just, you know, he just went and did that because his secure base was not here. So therefore he had no boundaries. Whereas a secure child, they understand that concept. They are able to adapt with their safe person. So if safe person mom is not there, they're at school their safe person sensibility will transfer to the teacher or another school employee or and so forth. So they know that they're safe in this place. And so are those are the two differences that you'll see in how they manifest. Okay, next slide. All right, so um, how much time do I have? Do I have enough time to go over this by any chance, anybody? So we have, okay. a, go ahead. So we have about 28 more minutes and so, I think that you do have some time. We have eight minutes scheduled for the next breakout room, but we can take that down to five. So, okay, have time. Okay, great. All righty. 
So um, the next is the educational alphabet of abbreviations. So um, if you ever are working with a school or you're in an organization that supports a school system or is sort of like an advocate for, for Native families in a school system or, you know, what have you, whatever the situation may be, um, you may be invited to assist with an IEP meeting or um, maybe go to the for an FBA or anything like that. And so in the school lingo, we have these acronyms um, that I deal with quite a bit, but if you're not familiar with them, I believe I found a good little cheat sheet that um, I think is going to be downloaded to the chat. Is that correct? That you can use if you're ever in, an, in a situation like that and you're like, I don't even know what kind of meeting this is. I'm supposed to go to school and I'm supposed to be at this meeting, but what does it even mean? Yes, the resources okay. will the resource will be available in the chat. Okay, so an IEP meeting is something that pertains to special education. Um, you can go to the next slide. So it is individualized education plan is what the acronym stands for. And when a student qualifies for special ed, um, it might be one of those initial meetings you might be invited to where they are going to talk about whether or not the student will qualify for special ed services or if they didn't. And sometimes if they don't qualify for special ed, what they'll, what they'll recommend is a 504. Now the difference between an IEP and a 504, a 504 um, document is what we call a, sort of like a, a document that still hits within the laws that offer and provide equality for all kids and learners, but it's for gen general education kids, kids that did not qualify for special ed or the need for special ed is not present. Maybe it might be a temporary um, thing that they need for, you know, for a certain amount of time. Um, for example, if a student broke their hand and it's their writing hand and there's going to be tests coming up, they might have a 504 written where they might have special accommodations needed so that they can do their tests and still have a, a good chance. Maybe they might have a, a, a scribe assigned in that, you know, as far as the laws and all those things that are concerned, it's just sort of a official way of saying, okay, yeah, we're allowing this during this time so that this can happen. Um, whereas an IEP is something a little more long-term. So if a student qualifies for an IEP, let's say in second grade, the IEP can follow that kid clear up through 12th grade if he qualifies for whatever reason, depending uh, what they'll do is they'll do um, an assessment where they'll see if, it, if, if his um, need is due to a learning disability and that learning disabilities won't go away. It's just something they have to learn how to uh, accommodate and deal with and, you know, as they go through life. Um, so uh, within the IEP, however, if they have behavioral needs, um, they'll have something uh, possibly, not every, kid, not every kid will have this, but some that do that need that extra support for behaviors they'll have what, what is called an FBA, which is a Functional Behavioral Assessment. And they'll oftentimes be paired with what they call a BIP, a Behavioral Intervention Plan. And so what the function of behavior does is it actually goes and the, the person doing the plan will go in and do uh, several observations, a handful of observations, and really connect to see uh, what the behavior of concern is and does it pertain to um, the kid or does it pertain to an environment? Does it pertain to maybe teaching style? I mean, there's so many things to look for when you're doing one of those. And once that's determined and the function of behavior is determined, which is, it falls in the category of under four functions of behavior. Once that's determined, then they'll write a behavior intervention plan that will address that and kind of help the teacher or educators when this kid goes through his 
grades as he goes through school, they'll have that in his file and they'll just look, okay, yeah, his behavior function is this and, you know, and oftentimes they can be revised as the kid grows. Sometimes they'll, they'll mature and they won't need it anymore, uh, depending on how it's written. Sometimes it's written for younger kids and if they're in seventh grade, they no longer need that accommodation. They can just do away with it and have it removed. Um, RTI, response to intervention, that's what that means. It's actually um, some schools will use RTI and they'll say, oh yeah, that's RTI. Well, what it is is basically sort of a system of um, how their building is structured to respond to uh, things that need to happen. Um, PBIS is another one. Um, it's positive behavior intervention supports. So it's just another name for a different form of RTI. They're kind of parallel, but depending on what region or area you are, one, you know, one district may leave more lead more to RTI, some one district may lean more to PBS, but they really have a lot of commonalities in terms of how they are presented because they're both sort of a systematic thing. MTSS is kind of the new buzzword thing. A lot of buildings uh, and the movement within our intervention world uh, is going and they're following with what they call MTSS, which is a multi-tiered support services. And interestingly enough, my official job title is an MTSS person. I'm actually the one who goes in and assists with kids that are having problems. If they need a FBA written, I write the FBA. I have to find their function of behavior and so forth. Uh, go and do interventions, check in, check out type of interventions. Um, there's just a whole cocktail of interventions available that you know I go and work with students. So that is unfortunately something that might not be as common. Uh, our district is pretty fortunate that they're investing in that to have a person um, with those skills and, and be able to do that within every elementary building. Um, we don't have them in secondary anymore. We used to, but not anymore. What they've done is they shifted us all, us and all of us into elementary levels. So we kind of go and we support um, principals, vice principals, and counselors with some of that work. So um, it kind of gets to be a little more specialized in certain areas. But that's if your building has an MTSS support person, then you're very lucky. Um, I'd say utilize them. Next slide. Okay. So, where do we begin? When we look at multi tiered support, and it actually is an umbrella term sometimes that covers um, like what kind of support services do you have in your building? Uh, as far as schools go, um, you have, so if something happens, let's say a kiddo experiences trauma and he's beginning to act out in class, who responds to that? Is it the principal? Is it the counselor? Is it another support person you have in building? That's not the MTSS, but maybe someone who's like a, that manages behavior. Some buildings can be very punitive. Some are very socially, emotionally uh, supportive. So it really does depend where you're located um, and what that multi-tiered support is going to look like. Basically explains how is the building support services um, created and how is it set up. So um, when you look at that and you look at the community that you're in, or even the kind of school that you're in, some schools don't have the funding to hire an outside person just to do that. So they have to be creative. They might hire, uh, instead of a certified person, a certified person is someone who has the education and the certificates to um, do it, like myself. Or they can hire a classified person, a classified classified person is someone who has a high school diploma um, but still can do the basic stuff 
but they won't be able to to uh, do reports or go in and do observations or any of the things, the upper level things that maybe I would do. So um, it, it just depends the area that you're at and looking at how you're going to work with them. Um, usually, uh, um, fortunately, some buildings are not as communicative with families, um, not because it's intentional. I think it's because sometimes they'll make the effort, but like maybe the cell phone got shut off, so there's no message or there's no email available or whatever whatever the case may be. And, and we ran into that as well, too. Sometimes the parents don't want to be contacted, so they make sure um, contact avenues are not as accessible um, and you know, we'll relate that to the the whole uh, trauma stuff that could fall under that as well please don't talk to me school I don't want to talk to you right now and so therefore I'm going to make it really hard we have a lot of wrong numbers listed that were entered in the registration forms if parents don't want to be contacted they'll intentionally put the wrong phone number so um, some families just like to keep us distant, um, but uh, our building, speaking just for my building, um, we like to be inclusive with families. We do a lot of check-in calls where the kids can call their parents if they're uh, misbehaving. Sometimes it's just a matter of the kids having and connecting with that touchstone, and if it's their parents that's the touchstone, that's actually really helpful, and we found a lot of positive results in doing that. Um, and making that connection available when the kids need it. Okay, next slide. Okay, so as we are going into the second breakout section, um, what I'd like to do, and I'm not, and many of you come from different areas, different organizations, uh, maybe different roles. Um, thinking about where you sit in terms of how your mindset and what it is you do in your work. Um, think about what would be helpful. I mean, how, how can you begin to work uh, with doing some of these things, understanding the residuals of trauma and how that pertains to education? Um, go ahead, next slide. We have points of conversation for that. Um, so, in each of those breakout rooms, uh, think about, if you're in the academics room, think about ideas that you can share with one another. Maybe what you're doing in your community is working. Maybe it's something you can share with someone else who has, you know, struggles in terms of, I don't know how to, I have no idea how to improve academics. Um, so, what the point of this second breakout is for you to share with one another in terms of um, how you can move forward with this. Uh, a lot of times, even just sharing what you're doing in your work or even what you've seen, if it's not something you're doing directly, even what you've seen in your community that you maybe like or you thought was a good idea. Um, love to hear your ideas because this uh, second breakout room is really for collaboration and idea sharing. Um, as we all know, as Native people, even though we're all Native American, we all come from different areas, we come from different tribes, and our views and our practices can be very different, but they can work for where we're at. So it might be something you would be able to adapt to. I mean, that's just valuable information in either way. So I encourage you to share. Um, so there'll be four breakout rooms. Uh, one will be pertain to academics. One will be pertain to attendance behavior and social emotional supports. So depending which room you're on, I'd like to focus on one of those four topics. And um, some of these points of conversation, I think we can leave this slide up so you can um, reference. Uh, room one, what type of supports did you guys come up with for attendance? What kinds of things did you, ideas were talked um, about? So some of the things that, um, we talked about in regards to attendance and, and how we can mend, heal, and create trust with families that need support to get their kids to school on time. Um, some of the schools um, that we, I have worked with, um, you know, that could be as little as providing an alarm clock, um, providing them clean 
undergarment socks, providing them a place to wash their clothes so that they can come to school with clean clothes or washing their clothes for them so that they will um, feel comfortable coming to school instead of, because sometimes it's just those little things, you know, they don't want to come to school with no socks or they don't want to come to school with dirty clothes or maybe they don't have a phone that is in working order. So just those simple alarm clocks that you can buy at Walmart for $5, those Mm -hmm. make huge impacts within the household. So those are just some things. And also um, asking the family what type of barriers they have listening to them and taking in consideration for those. Maria? Thank you. I just wanted to add too, um, looking at those resources, like you were mentioning the clothes. Um, I worked in a school where there was a resource in the community where they would provide vouchers for families to provide or to go purchase shoes. Um, It was, I forget the name of the resource. Uh, but that was one resource that we, we utilized for our families. We also did like a food bank. Um, so on the weekends we would send home, um, um, food items because they would be like, it was just another resource, not so much about the attendance portion, but yeah, definitely what you shared as far as, you know, just seeking out and asking uh, families what their needs are, what, what is the barriers that they're experiencing and trying to assist them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, we have a bite to go program here in Spokane. So we send bags of food home with uh, some of the kids on weekends. That's always a great, great thing. Uh, Room two, behaviors. That would be my room. Um, Anyone want to share? Was it? Samantha. Samantha. Uh, yeah, so I shared, um, I work for the Washoe Tribe, which is in Nevada and California, and we um, implemented a behavioral attendance and grade um, program, and we went from about 22 participants um, at the beginning of last school year, and what we did was we, we just recognized every some, um, every quarter if they got good grades, if they were um, meeting attendance rule, um, goals, and if they were having positive behavior in the classroom. And at the start, we had about 22 kids. And by the end, we had over 75. Um, and then this year, we put it into the classrooms for the elementary schools of doing just behavioral reminders. So they had a binder that had, you know, the days of the week and it, before the first recess, if they didn't have to be talked to, or if they had good behavior, they got a sticker. Um, and what we found was that just that internal pride that they were feeling um, really improved to the behavioral outputs of the kids who were deemed behavioral issues. Thank you, Samantha. Social and emotional learning, room three. Hey, everyone. My name is Dawn Ironhawk. I am working with the Native Connection Suicide Prevention here on Spirit Lake in North Dakota. Um, for our, for our program, what we do here on Spirit Lake, we kind of do something like a, a talking circle with the youth. Um, cause I know there's a lot of children here that don't have that, um, support in the home. Uh, there's really not, there's a big trust issue a lot. So that's why we do these things with our youth. We, we try to meet with them at least once a month and, you know, and then try to get like their inputs on stuff on, you know, what their ideas would be, would be and how it works for them. That's how we would do it here. And we look, uh, work with our local schools. Uh, and then some of the other ideas that came up in the talking on the group was some breathing techniques um, using cards, um, like a weighted blanket or vest. Um, I think that was it. If I missed something, if someone can, <laughs> and that's pretty much what we came up with. Awesome. Thank you, Don. Uh, room four academics. Our room um, for room four um, discussed as far as academics and external programming to support of reaching out to outside programs for peer-to-peer learning and mentoring programs for the students. Um, 
is what we discussed, um, the types of supports for just um, cultural learning, um, area learning, as well as just the peer to um, student um, peer mentoring to support those academics. Yes, yes, peer mentoring is always a powerful one. Um, and I, I think it has to do with either the student feels more equal to a student helper as opposed to an adult who sometimes over explains or uses the language that the child hasn't learned about yet in terms of terminology and those kinds of things. Thank you. I believe that brings us to our close, questions and closing. Thank you all for sharing and thank you for joining us for this presentation. And I hope you learned something. Uh, next slide, Mark. Um, you know, I would like to extend our gratitude toward um, Anna Eaglebear for joining us and creating such a safe space to talk about something that impacts um, all of us in a different way. And so thank you for talking about education and how that impacts um, and historical trauma and how that impacts our youth in our community. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being on the call. If you have any questions or um, anything you would like to follow up on, please don't hesitate to reach out to your GTAs and they will um, get those questions over to us and we will follow up. Over to you, BC. Thank you, Alma. We're closing up here soon. We appreciate you hanging in there with us and um, uh, joining us today. We've just got a few more webinars left for this uh, um, funding year, and that includes traditional foods as medicine, uh, traditional ecological knowledge, um, healing and building protective factors for youth through indigenous art, and naming ceremonies and youth wellness. So keep an eye on your weekly digest your, uh, for updates on those and the dates and a way to register. Thanks again for joining us today. Take care.